Anyway, this document, uh, I call it the Mysterious Seven Miles. And it explains why nobody could read the Stratton book. Uh, so I'll, I'll just run down it and paraphrase. This concerns the initial trip to the first ravine after the massacre, and the Stratton book researchers were led astray by all of in Stratton's writing, in which a few miles seem like 30, leading people out into the various mountains and the desert. And in, fa in fact, the distance covered was less than seven miles. At one point, she describes over several pages, seemingly a long journey over tops of mountains, when she actually was referring to less than a 20-minute climb up the final part of the ravine, up to the spine. Her writing is not linear. In other words, a document all in a line of each step beginning to end. It was not linear. That's what I discovered. She does several loops in which she describes the entire segment before them, then loops back into the story at the location mentioned pages before. She also describes terrain in a tiny spot several times. Okay, page 60, Stratton. We descended the hill uh, not knowing their intentions concerning us, but under the expectation that they would probably take our lives by slow torture. After we had descended the hill, meaning back down the wagon trail where they just came up the hill, after we had descended the hill and crossed the river and traveled uh, about one half of a mile of a dim trail leading through a dark, rough, narrow defile in the hills, we came to an open place where there had been a camp before and halted. Okay, don't try and read this. I know you can't see it on the screen. Okay, Olive wrote in retrospect about what she knew lay ahead. They were not in a low ravine at all at the first. They were about to enter it. Having been there, the ravine is a low sloping plain. The final assault is less than one hour of ascending. It was okay to do the first fire rest since they were hidden from view of the trails below. She saw they stopped at a previous camp because the Indians most certainly were using it. She said a half a mile, uh, actually it was more than a mile. Why then was that distance not exaggerated? As per her, her pattern, walking over level desert was ignored or given short distances. It was also right after the massacre. Time would have raced and they were freshly rested and they had just eaten. Eat, <laughs> had just eaten. <laughs> Next she says, after the meal and about an hour's rest, they began to pack and make preparations to proceed. Okay, here's my wording. The reader is led to believe the stop was a total of one hour. Olive did not say that at all. If a person reads a sentence, combine the time for the meal to cook in ashes, then they prefer, and then an hour's rest, the time was not less than 2.5 hours. Uh, next in Stratton, Lorenzo tells his story. Many pages have said, now this is in the book. Now Stratton interjects Lorenzo, tells his story. Many pages have passed. When Olive's story picks up again, the reader visualizes a great amount of time has passed. It hasn't. Page 81. Soon after, we struck a fire with wild cotton. Note the pages that have gone by, yet the writing now doubles back to the gradual slope leading to the ravine as the next sentence shows. Page 84. While at this camp awaiting the finished meal and just after twilight, Okay, that defines the time. The full moon arose and looked in on our rock girt gourds. That defines their location and the time after the massacre, which was approximately an hour. Page 87. After several pages of reminiscing of what a full moon meant to her in her childhood, we came upon all of uh, Stratton's worst possible loopbacks and mixing of words as it pertains to time, location, and distance. 
Here's Olive's words. But these harrowing meditations are suddenly interrupted. Cattle are placed in order for traveling. Do you understand what those words mean? They are back at the site of the massacre. Five of the Indians are placed in charge of the girls and welcome or unwelcome, they must, uh, they must go away, they, we must go away, we know not where. We were started at a rapid pace for several hours. One of the Indians takes the lead, Marianne and myself follow bareheaded and shoeless. You see what I'm saying? Now they are back at the massacre when they were just up at the ravine. Now they're back at the massacre. Okay, that's why I say the story is now doubled back to them leaving the massacre. They were up in the ravine. Now they are leaving the massacre. She also says rapid pace for several hours. Almost any reader would then visualize himself marching for hours out into the desert. That's what confused the researchers. Okay, next, here's Olive. We were traveling at a pace we soon learned much beyond our strength. Soon the light of the campfire was hid as my eyes turned back full of tears in search of the sleeping place of our kindred. It could not be distinguished from the peaks and rocks about it. We must have traveled at the rate of four or five miles an hour. Okay, here's my words. But the fire is just fading, yet they have gone miles. She gives a rate, leading the reader into visualizing miles, when in fact they were ascending to the spine, 20 minutes of hiking. Okay, let's keep going. Our feet were soon lacerated, as in shadowed places, we were unable to pick our way. That identifies they were walking in the moonlight. I have walked right up there in the moonlight. And we were frequently stumbling upon stones and rocks, which made them bleed freely. Our way had been mostly over a succession of small bluff points of high mountain chains. There were no high mountain chains. She was talking a distance of approximately 300 feet. Uh, but notice in her description, she describes the area exactly once you've been up there. Uh, we halted for a few moments about the middle of the night. We halted for a few moments. This places them as, now these are my words, this places them as taking a, a rest stop at the saddle at the top of the spine. Okay, besides this, we had no rest until about noon of the next day. When we came to an open place, a few acres of level sandy soil adorned with occasional drifty, beautiful tree but high and seemingly impassable mountains hemming us on both sides. Okay, now those words, she identifies where they were. They were in the ravine. Besides this, we had no rest. However, now these are my words, however, an astonishing 12 hours had passed to make it down from the spine in which I myself was there and could have easily hiked down to that flat in three hours at most. A large amount of time was spent doing something, doing something. I feel, I, I personally feel the top saddle is where the moccasins were fashioned for them. They were up there 12 hours, but she said we briefly paused. Then they rest killed the cattle on the spot, uh, the flat spot. This took hours. They did not leave till dusk approached. They head across the desert towards the next range, towards the Snug Ravine. Uh, page 90. We halted in the Snug Ravine about 10 that night, which is correct. That, that is correct. She referred to it as that because she was looking right at a major feature, a cirque. They, they were at the lowest outlet of it. That is within the bluff top mountains that she referred to. Um, okay. I'm surprised the battery of the camera is still going. Okay. It's now been 30 pages and they just left the ravine at mile seven. 
20 pages were Lorenzo's story. So a full 10 pages was from the time of the massacre to leave the ravine. The, re the readers visualize themselves as 30 or more miles out into the desert, including all over unknown mountains. Olive simply gave uh, long descriptions about one small area, as Stratton did, because there was nothing else to write. They packed the book. They, they took two or three miles and packed the book with it. Using times and checkpoints, she actually described the trek very well, including describing small mounds in their path they worked around. Conclusion. Conclusion. The first seven miles shows that researchers were confused by her wording, when in fact she described it quite accurately, including known exact spots I've been to myself. Also, the confusing editing and layout of the book took descriptions during the trek then left them to return back many pages later. For one dramatic feature, the final 20 minutes to work up the top ravine, she kept rehashing the same info worded differently. Worded differently. Okay, what stands out to me in the route to the camp in the first ravine segment is that her descriptions after having hiked uh, the exact spot are so accurate, it leads me to think this is solved uh, with the exact hike, th this is solved with the exact site hiked in person, and her descriptions turn out to be astonishingly accurate. It is also true that the rest of her writing is confusing, confusing yet accurate. Therefore, I rule that out, that her wording is accurate. Is there clear evidence of lying? Olive would tell small lies, such as, I looked back and saw the wagon run. She saw no such thing. She didn't. It's impossible. However, she knew the wagon was there, and so she visually described it, and so it wasn't a lie. She said, we came upon uh, huts half buried in the ground. She didn't see that at all. I believe she added that later to her narrative because of travel and interactions with the Hohokam and others that do dig pits in their huts. And also on her initial interviews at the fort, she correctly named the various local tribes, including the locations and number of Indians in each one. This certainly shows she was traveling much further than she wanted to admit. The huts half buried in the ground with the dirty urchins she talked about would have been, would have been half to three quarters of the way back towards the massacre site, if not the full way.